So, we brought another prose for them. This is what we're talking about. And it's the, the loaf of bread that is offered uh, that becomes the body of Christ. So, up to this point, we've covered, we've, we've taken out the middle of this bread. <laughs> and on this, it says, I, I S X S Jesus Christ Nika uh, victorious Jesus Christ victorious and this is placed on the center of this pattern of these rows here. Then we talked about in the right hand of the King Jesus we put this triangular piece which symbolizes the, the Theotokos. And then that brings us to where we are in. So this part you're going to see is on the other side. It's nine small triangles. <clears throat> so you see here, there's nine small triangles. We're going to read about what each one of these represents. Sometimes, depending on bread, you would actually cut out each of these little triangles and then place them in three rows of, of three. But a lot of times the bread, the bread has to be kind of pretty doughy to be able to do that. When the, when the crust is kind of harder on the outside, it's, it's too difficult. So we just cut it in one, one piece. <laughs> All right, so it says, from the seal of the same proskora, so <clears throat> this is the seal here, or a third one, meaning that you can take one p if, if multiple families have offered the prospera and they each want to kind of be included, then you can take this piece from the first, this from the second, this from the third. <laughs> the priest then cuts out the first of the nine small triangular particles and pressed upon it and places it on the left hand side of the lamb. So on its left hand side, our right hand saying in honor and memory of the Supreme Commanders, the Archangels Michael and Gabriel, and of all the bodiless powers of heaven. <laughs> so basically what's gonna happen here is that each of these nine is gonna represent a, basically a class or a category of saints. <laughs> so the first one is for the holy <laughs> angels. <laughs> holy angels assist the priests. <clears throat> the heavenly powers also minister in the work of the divine economy, God's plan of salvation. And that is why the celebrant places to the left of the lamb a particle in their honor. Before the incarnation of the word, the angels were definitely aware of the mystery of Christ. When the word became man, God was manifested in the flesh and seen by angels, according to first Timothy. So the angels never saw God. Right. That's what that's what it's or God was manifested in the mystery of Christ. So, uh, uh, Christ. <laughs> so yeah. He's so the word of the king. Yes. So when he put on flesh, he then became mm -hmm. visible to angels. But before that time, to them also was his essence invisible. The mystery of the divine economy, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, that's from Ephesians, <laughs> was manifested first to the holy angels. They then revealed it to human beings. First, the angels were initiated into the divine mystery of Jesus and love for mankind. Then the grace of knowledge passed through them to us, talking about the incarnation. The archangel Gabriel visited the priest Zechariah to announce the future birth of the forerunner, John the Baptist, who, according to the words of the prophet, was to be a messenger before the face of the Lord. The same archangel visited the mother of God to announce to her that the divine mystery of the inexpressible incarnation of God the Word would be accomplished in her. Again, an angel visited Joseph to tell him that the virgin had conceived of the Holy Spirit and was carrying the Savior of the world. So all these are from the, uh, the first two chapters of Luke and Matthew. Finally, when Christ was born in Bethlehem, an angel of the Lord visited the shepherds, since they were pure of soul, living as they did in peace and quiet, and announced to them the joyful news. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. <laughs> now, in the liturgical Bethlehem, the holy prophecies. So remember we said, when we looked into the chapel, and we looked off to the left of the altar, so that little apse back there which is where we, we do all of this. 
That's the, we're calling that the liturgical Bethlehem. That's called the prothesis. So, and why typically the, the icon there is of the nativity or the extreme humility of Christ, the bridegroom of Christ. <laughs> But that, that section is called, is imagined as Bethlehem, the place where Christ is born and takes on flesh. And the prophecies is like the first seed. Prophecies, yeah. Uh, the first place. The yeah. place before. Yeah. Before. It's, so normally the, uh, the table of oblation is what it's called, the offertory table in, uh, in the West. Yeah, it's a place before. So. The, the table that he places the gifts before God, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so now in the liturgical Bethlehem, the Holy Prophecy is where the mystery of the incarnation of the Word is celebrated, what we're doing now. Angels of the Lord appear to celebrants, who, like the shepherds, are pure of soul. There was one elder who was pure and holy, and while he was solemnizing the proskomidi, so the place is called the prophecy. But this procedure that we're doing is called the proskomidi. <clears throat> so while he was solemnizing the proskomidi, in other words, doing these prayers, he saw holy angels standing to his right and left. <clears throat> At every divine liturgy, a multitude of the heavenly hosts is present, glorifying God as once they did in Bethlehem. The story is told of the holy bishop Nephon that during the great entrance, so that part of the liturgy when we come with the chalice, as we be supposed to. <clears throat> He saw a multitude of angels accompanying the priest, joyfully singing ineffable hymns. And when the priest placed the precious gifts on the holy table, the altar, the angels covered the altar with their wings. Then two cherubim came and stood on the celebrant's right and two seraphim on his left. <clears throat> so sometimes you'll see uh, the liturgical fans that the altar boys carry with the symbol of the angels on them. <clears throat> and usually they're carried in the procession anywhere this goes so they're covering it like like the angels covering christ and so especially when you put it on the altar the fans you see this more in the russian tradition they'll have the fans actually come down to kind of cover the the altar table have you ever felt or had any sense of hmm. all right i haven't seen any i haven't seen any angels but have i sensed yeah, I would say yes. Or you would have to sense it. Yeah. Because everything you're doing back there is to the Holy Spirit. I mean, yeah. you know, it's a mystery, the whole thing. Yeah, I, I would say yes. Yeah. I I mean, I still remember my first, when I was first ordained, <clears throat> and uh, the tradition is that you celebrate liturgy every day for 40 days. And so I was in Thessaloniki, and in our parish, you know, we didn't, we didn't have liturgy every day, but <laughs> there was this private school in our parish, <laughs> uh, Orthodox private school, and they had a chapel there. And so they always liked to have liturgies for the kids. They would take turns, the classes would come in. <laughs> and so my first liturgy after I was ordained, we went there to this chapel, and it was all these kindergartners. And, um, and they were, uh, the teachers had trained them to sing the whole liturgy everything <laughs> you know all the all the parts that they could know and it was like i could feel i still remember that <laughs> i felt the presence of the angels then it was like the the kids voice <laughs> <over it. laughs> during the holy anaphora so the, the anaphora is it's basically that part in the liturgy when i turn around or when, when the priest turns around it says, let us lift up our hearts, we lift them to the Lord, let us give thanks unto the Lord. That's the anaphora. <laughs> so during the holy anaphora, angels stand around the priest. All the ranks of heavenly powers sing praises in a loud voice, and the space around the altar is filled in honor of the one, Christ our Master, who is being sacrificed. In the divine <laughs> liturgy, mysteries are performed which the holy angels long to look into. They are present as ministers and servants, but only the priest can celebrate the divine mystagogy. <laughs> when the pure and worthy priest enters the sanctuary to celebrate the divine liturgy, he is invisibly surrounded by a great host of bodiless and divine angels who serve him throughout the divine liturgy with great reverence. But although the holy angels serve the priest at the divine liturgy, they themselves are not able to celebrate the liturgy on their own without a priest. So the priest is like some major dignitary of the king's while the angels are like his soldiers and servants. <clears throat> they say that the angels uh, 
are jealous of, of humans even because angels lack a body. So they're not able to partake physically of communion. They're not able to hold in their hands like the priest uh, to consecrate the, the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So the angels are, are jealous of uh, us for this. That's like Satan. Though. Yes, exactly. They fail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the priest then cuts out the further eight corresponding parts, saying, so each of these paragraphs is for <clears throat> one of the triangles. <laughs> of the honored glorious prophet, foreigner, and Baptist John, of the holy glorious prophets, Moses and Aaron, Elias, Elisha, David, Jesse, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, of the three holy youths, the prophet Daniel, and all the holy prophets. So that's number two. <laughs> so you see that's a that's a whole class of saints, the prophets. Third, of the holy, glorious, and all praised apostles, Peter and Paul, John the theologian of the twelve, the seventy, and all the holy apostles. Fourth, of our fathers among the saints, great hierarchs and ecumenical teachers, Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, and John Chrysostom, Athanasius and Cyril, and John the Merciful, Patriarch of the <laughs> Nicholas of Mira, Spirit of Trimethos, Gregory Palamas, Dionysius of Aegean, and Nectarios of Pentapolis, the Holy God during the Fathers of the Seven Councils, and all the Holy Hierarchs. So these are all the bishops. Fifth is the martyrs of the Holy Proto Martyr and Archdeacon Stephen. Of the holy glorious Greek martyrs, George of Victorious, Demetrius the Mercer, the Theodore the Recruit, the Theodore the General, of the higher martyrs, higher martyr means priest, priest martyr. Of the higher martyrs, Ignatius, Polycarp, Karalambos, Eleutherios, and Clovis the Aetolian. Of the holy martyrs, Thecla, Catherine, Barbara, Irene, Ephemia, Kiriaki, Marina, Pariskivi, and all the holy martyrs. Uh, six. Of our venerable and God bearing fathers, Anthony, Ephemio, Sardis the Sanctified, Arsenius, Paisius, Pemans, Cicelez, Ephraim, and Isaac the Syrians, Maximus the Confessor, John of Damascus, Simeon the New Theologian, Dionysius of Olympus, John the Russian, Seraphim of Sarov, Nicholas Ponas, Arsenius the Cappadocian, of the Athenite fathers, Peter, Athanasius, Maximus, Nicodemus, Siloan, and Sardis, of the venerable women, Mary of Egypt, Theopistis, mm -hmm. Simplifici, Macrina, and all our venerable fathers and mothers. So that's six categories, all the ascetic <laughs> fathers and mothers, the, the, the monks uh, and nuns, basically. <clears throat> Seventh, of the holy and glorious wonder workers and unmercenary physicians, Cosmas and Damien, Cyrus and John, Pandalemon, Hermalaus, Samson and Diomedes, Mokios and Anictitus, Thalelemus, mm -hmm. Prefon, and all the holy unmercenary saints. Unmercenary means without pay. It's a kind of uh, difficult, <laughs> difficult translation to translate that word. Unmercenary doesn't make it a whole, a whole lot clearer. Um, but meaning those saints who were dedicated to healing without accepting any pay. <laughs> So that's the seventh category. Eighth, of the holy and righteous forebears of God, Joachim and Anna, we're going to celebrate them on Friday. Uh, they're the parents of Mary. Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of St. John the Baptist. Joseph the betrothed, the uh, stepfather of Christ. <laughs> of, and then we name the saints of the day and of the church. So if we were celebrating in the chapel here, for the church, we would say St. Nicholas, but he was already commemorated earlier, so we wouldn't say it again. Uh, but And then the saints of the day, whoever they happen to be. Uh, and of all the saints at whose intercessions visit us abroad. <laughs> and then the ninth, last one in the bottom right-hand corner is of our father among the saints, John Christus, the Archbishop of Constantinople, assuming that's the liturgy <laughs> that we're celebrating. But St. Basil, then we say St. Basil instead. At the Divine Liturgy, the Assembly of Saints is present together with Christ, and the faithful experience the communion of saints made manifest. <laughs> After placing the Lamb, well, this is the Lamb, which is being offered on the pattern, with these books here, the celebrant cuts out pieces in honor and in memory of all the saints. This reveals the indissoluble bond of the transcendent and sacred union of the saints with Christ. Because the saints have struggled together with Christ, they enjoy greater glory and exaltation through this terrible, awesome mystery, through communion and the saving sacrifice. <clears throat> and indeed, the more we commemorate them, the more they reconcile us with Christ and unite us with him. 
The church is the assembly of the saints, and the divine liturgy is par excellence the mystery that assembles the entire church into a godly way of human life, a unified and single accord. In the liturgy, we are with all the saints. The choir of saints has fulfilled the purpose of the divine economy. So they fulfilled the, God's plan of salvation. God, the word, took flesh, preached, worked miracles, suffered, and died in order for human beings to move from earth to heaven and become heirs of the heavenly kingdom. So that's, that's all of our goal. <laughs> the choir of saints is the proof that the kingdom of God has already been given to us. Through the myriads of members, it has sent, like colonists, to heaven. The church has truly inherited the very kingdom of heaven. So already, even now, we are experiencing in the church the kingdom of heaven. When we begin the divine liturgy, as the church assembled together in one place, it's like the kingdom of heaven is breaking in from the future, from the end of time, from its heavenly place. It's breaking in to the, our gathering in the church. <laughs> We're experiencing already this, what it's going to be like somehow, some foretaste, some glimpse of what it's going to be like in the kingdom. <laughs> we give thanks to the Lord for the good things he has bestowed on the saints because we regard them as our own family. And we feel that the gifts God has given them are ours as well. And together with the saints, we give thanks to the giver, offering gifts in the home. At the Divine Liturgy, we live the mystery of the Church, because each Eucharistic community is the one flock which offers its gifts to the one shepherd, with one mouth and one heart. We are nourished on the Holy Body of Christ, on Holy Communion, and the Church is made manifest as the Body of Christ. With this we are nourished, with this we are mingled, and we have become the one body of Christ. Communion in the Holy Body of Christ creates the communion and unity of the Church. As we partake in the Holy Body of Christ, so too we become, we become the Body of Christ. So you see there's this double imagery going on with the Body of Christ that we, the faithful, when we're assembled together, we represent Christ's body in this particular place and time. The bread that we bring and offer and is consecrated by God also is the body of Christ. And as we partake of it, in this Eucharistic gathering, in the liturgy, we become the body of Christ. <clears throat> so there's two kind of bodies of Christ that are merging uh, in this moment. <clears throat> communion and divine love creates the communion of the love of the saints. <clears throat> in this way, the life of every saint is constantly extended within <laughs> time. For before passing through the gate of death, the saints partook of the food, which is the medicine of immor immortality, and through death, they entered into life. So this phrase, the medicine of immortality, is, is uh, often used of communion, <clears throat> and it's actually a phrase from St. Ignatius, the God-bearer, who wrote that in a letter that it still exists that is preserved from uh, 107 AD, <clears throat> and he refers to, he was a bishop of Antioch, and he refers to communion as the medicine of immortality, that which makes us immortal, holy communion. So, and it, basically he's saying here that we, we enter into the life of the saints uh, through, the, even though the saints lived like St. Ignatius lived over 1900 years ago, we live with them because of the common experience of partaking of this medicine of mortality, this <laughs> the body of Christ. It's one and the same throughout time and place. So all of us are partaking of the same thing and all constitute the one body of Christ. All right. <clears throat> so now, now we cut out a piece from the side here in a triangle formation like this. We put it in front of the lamb. <clears throat> the priest then the priest cuts out a small particle saying, Remember, O Master, lover of mankind, every bishopric of the Orthodox, our Archbishop Alexius, the honored order of presbyters, the diaconate in Christ, and every word of clergy and of monastics, our brothers and fellow celebrants, priests and deacons, and all our brethren whom through your compassion you have called to your service, most loving master. And he places it below the lamp. 
He then commemorates the bishop who ordained him, if he is still alive. So we commemorate it when we say Archbishop Alexios, because he's the, the ruling hierarch. He's the ruling bishop of this geographical location. But then after we say that, we commemorate, it's not always the case that, that the bishop here is the one who ordained a particular priest. So there, another bishop ordained me. So I would then, after commemorating Alexios, then I would commemorate the bishop who ordained me, if, if he is still alive, and then commemorates those whose names he has among the living, taking out, out particles and placing them in the same way below the lamp. <clears throat> All right, so this is what we do. So this piece that was underneath here, so originally, this is what, what it looks like here. <clears throat> so this piece goes here. This piece that was underneath, we cut in a cross here. And from this piece, we take out crumbs. <clears throat> so along this line, horizontal line, we take out crumbs for the living. So every for everyone we are praying for, you know, praying, I'm praying for each of my children. I'm taking out one. <laughs> and all the, the lists that I have and all the names that you submit, which is why it's so important <clears throat> to submit names for the liturgy, because we take those names and we <laughs> read the names. And as we're reading the name, we, we take out the crumb and place it here on the pattern <clears throat> on this side for the living. <clears throat> all right, so we do that. I mean, and that could take a while, depending on how many names we have. I have a long list that I read from, and then if anyone brings a list, I read that one too. <laughs> they say that St. Nicholas Parnas, it's kind of a contemporary saint, early 20th century in Greece, that he would spend four hours reading names. <clears throat> Does I read them to you and you do the... No, you may read them. So you have like have the written side here, and as I'm reading them, I'm taking out the crumbs. Is there some difference in like, like he mentions presbyters and diaconate and then down further priests and deacons? Is there some differentiation? There? No, I don't know why it's, it's a, yeah, the honored order of presbyters. Really, what it's most of the time the book has so that the top one, the honored order of presbyters, diaconate, and Christ is general. And then we say our brothers and fellow celebrants. And then we actually name our fellow celebrants. <laughs> so priests. So I would say, Father Paul, Father Micah, Father Ernesto, and the deacons, Deacon Teton, and all our brethren. So the first is more general, and then it's more specific. All right, so then after we commemorate all the names of the living, this is the, the first priest who is doing this, and this is taking place again, remember, uh, we're at the beginning of Orthos, the beginning of uh, Matins. So it's maybe about 8.30 now. We started at 8.15, so maybe about 8.20, 8.30, that we're doing all this, <clears throat> and this could take, take a while. Then after we finish all the names of the living, then from another part of the seal, <clears throat> so we take, this is how I was taught to do it, the living from here, and then I take the departed from here. So then we take more particles here. Then from another part of the seal, the priest cuts further particles for the departed, say, and then we place them on the other side, over on this side. <clears throat> saying, for remembrance and forgiveness of sins of the blessed founders of this holy house. Uh, so that's why it's such a blessing to be part of uh, the founders of a church. And when the um, altar is consecrated, the names of the founders of the church are actually put into the altar by the bishop and sealed in there. <laughs> so we pray for the, we pray every liturgy for the blessed founders of this holy house. He then commemorates the bishop who ordained him if he is dead and commemorates those whose names he has among the departed. So the same thing, the list that we have with all the repose, now we read and put a crumb for each one of those. Uh, and he concludes by saying, so after we've finished all the names of the repose, and of all our Orthodox fathers and brethren who have fallen asleep in communion with you, Lord, love our mankind, and the hope of resurrection to eternal life. And he places particles for those he has commemorated on the back. Likewise, the deacon also commemorates those he wishes from the living and the dead as the priest cuts out particles for them. So the deacon doesn't actually, deacon, deacon's not here today, but the deacon doesn't actually 
take out the particles, but if he's standing here next to me, he's reading, he can be reading names uh, as well, right? <laughs> here in the US, we don't typically get uh, a lot of people submitting names. <laughs> Um, because it's really the best thing you can do for someone you love. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. 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 I don't hundreds of sheets of paper for every yeah. liturgy. And so and we don't keep them because the next liturgy, we're going to get another few hundred and then another few hundred. So, so we, don't we don't reuse them. Here in America, I'm so desperate. For them. <laughs> I keep them for like a year <laughs> because I just don't get that many. So, so it's the appropriate time to give them to you. Anytime. I mean, should we give them to Denise or it's like a, yeah. a neat list? Instead of I mean, if it's legible, it's good. But I'm used to... In Greece, people have really bad handwriting, and you learn how to you learn how to read the handwriting. But yeah, it's really it's a great gift that you can give to your loved ones to have them commemorated. And a lot of times, if you go visit a church or you go visit a monastery, okay, here it's not so common because the church is you know it's not like we have one on every corner like in Greece. But in Greece, if you go and visit a church to light a candle, people will light a candle and they'll and there will be lists uh, at the pangari. And they'll write the names and put it in the box. And then the next liturgy, the priest will all commemorate those names. It's just another way that we can pray for our loved ones or pray for people who, you know, maybe we heard that morning that so and so is going in for an operation. So we go to church without a candle for them and write the name on the list. Uh, let's see. All right. And finally, the priest says, remember me also, Lord, your unworthy servant, and forgive all my offenses, both voluntary and involuntary. And then we take out a particle for ourselves and put it among the living. And taking the sponge, he draws in together all the particles on the patent so that everything is safe and nothing will fall. So the sponge, I didn't bring it, but it's a flat, uh, a flat sponge. I think it has a special name. It should be a... a real natural sponge i think it's called an elephant ear um sponge maybe you guys know they, they have them down in the tampa area but anyway it's a it's hard for, yeah anyway they have a it's a thin sponge usually maybe about this big that we use to wipe things up and to move things around and make sure it doesn't fall off remember a master lover of mankind when the celebrant takes out the a particle of the prosper for a brother who is living, because it is placed near the Eucharistic bread, meaning the lamb here, <clears throat> the, this particle too is immediate. Uh, when that becomes the body of Christ in the course of the liturgy, the particle too is immediately sanctified. So, in other words, we're placing these particles, these crumbs, uh, representing the soul of the person we commemorated, <clears throat> knowing that this is going to become Jesus Christ. And so it's, it's placing them symbolically. Uh, symbolically doesn't mean not real. Symbolically it means through, through symbols something really happens uh, of placing them next to Christ. And so it's, it's a blessing. <clears throat> and when it is placed in the chalice, and then when we're getting ready for communion, and when you guys see the priest taking communion, and then after we take communion, we're preparing the gifts. <clears throat> we're putting everything that's on the patent into the chalice. And then in our case, since we have multiple chalices, we're preparing them as well. But all of these particles will go into the chalice. <laughs> and when it is placed in the chalice, it is united with the holy blood. That is why it transmits divine grace to the soul of the one for whom it is offered. So that's a, why it's such a blessing to put in names uh, and, and for the divine liturgy, because even if that person is not able to make the liturgy, <clears throat> it's like they've communed. You've, you've prayed for them, a particle's been placed next to Christ, it's been dipped in the blood of Christ. So even for both the living and especially for the dead who are no longer able to partake of communion, you can have them participating in communion <laughs> by placing their names in the liturgy. But that's all, we can only list four to the next step. Right. <laughs> you, can list, you can list non-Orthodox, I mean, what, 
what we do in, in, I mean, in Greece and Russia, it's not an issue because everybody's orthodox, but in America, we try to find some way, you know, like I'll read the list <laughs> and I'll place in a crumb for all the orthodox. And then for the non-orthodox, I'll read the name, but I won't place a crumb. And I say, okay, God, you do what you want. <laughs> In that we're here every Sunday. Why did we not appear? You know, I think probably, you know, I think there's a tendency to to cloak what we do in secrecy. You know what I mean? Mysterious. To make it more mysterious. Yeah. I think in in Greece, I noticed that too. Not not in terms of the priests, but in terms of the doctors. I noticed that I don't know if you any of you ever dealt with doctors or hospitals in Greece, but they they never explain anything, right? It's because they try to shroud it in mystery. Like you you can't possibly understand you know, <laughs> all the knowledge that I have about this. I can't possibly break it down dumb enough for you to understand. It. And and so they they cloak everything with a secrecy that makes you go, oh, it's a doctor. <laughs> I probably, maybe that's part of it. You know, I don't know. And a lot of times it's, it's pretty important. It is important. I mean, I, it's, it's, I don't know if it is, it sounds important. I mean, you know. But, you know, a lot of times, especially during the Turkocratia, you know, there's a period in Greece where the, the Turks occupied Greece, they, they forbid any seminaries, they forbid the priests to learn anything. So, a lot of times in the villages, especially, you know, the priest may not never had any training. He just learned from yeah. the previous priest. He may not even, he could maybe barely read. You know, there are cases in the Turkocratia where they just had memorized the liturgy, where they actually couldn't read, but had memorized the liturgy. So it may be that, you know, in years past, the priest didn't even know. They were just keeping, they were just repeating what had been handed yeah. down to them. You know, the last thing we wanted, your name was as an Orthodox Christian. Church department. Yeah, exactly. That's never knew that we could do that. Yeah, it's a really it's the best thing you can do. And and practices wow. too is you know the reason I like doing the practices every week. I mean is is yeah. But that's good too, but it's even even better. It's the liturgy. Yeah. So, but with the undated one, yeah. I always learned. My mother taught us this: that with the crumbs, you never let the crumbs right. hit the ground or hit the seat. You try to pick it all up because of what you just now teach. Because it's right? yeah, because it's yeah. blessed. It's yeah. blessed. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, all right. Uh, that is why it transmits the divine grace. Okay. So a spiritual communion takes place between that person, meaning the person represented by the crumb, and Christ. If the person commemorated is among the godly or those who have sinned but then repented, that person receives the communion of the Holy Spirit invisibly in the spirit. So in other words, if among the godly or among those who have sinned, like most of us, but repented, actually have repented of our sins, then we receive this, this grace. It's like we are receiving all the communion. So what is the person who is not repented? And it is orthodox, but not repented. God knows. <laughs> not God, 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 we don't judge. Yeah. God knows what happens. There was a, there was a story actually of... Um, I think it was Bishop Anthony of Soros. He was, I don't know if you ever heard of him. He passed away not too many years ago. <laughs> a very holy man in England. And uh, the, he would have so many names that uh, at a certain point, he was reading the names and reading the names and doing the crumbs. And eventually, he just took the names out like this. <laughs> God, read them. <laughs> Can you just replace you say one Nicholas? When you say when we pray for all Orthodox Christians, yeah. I mean, do we have to sit and say everybody's name? I mean, like I'm just asking. Yeah. Like if you picked out a poem in there for all Orthodox <laughs> Christians, yeah. Wouldn't that cover all of us? Not yeah. the same. I don't want to be covered. I don't want to be named by name. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I mean, but I mean, if you didn't know, yeah, would we call yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, you would. I mean, but. 
It's like umbrella, whatever. It's like when people listen, you know, like at um, Soul Saturday, people will be listening for yeah, priests yeah. because yeah. they want they want to make sure they want to make sure they hear their name, right? Yeah. But we say it. We say it. <laughs> the names are so cool. Because there's something special about it. Is it is it logical? I mean, God knows the names, you know. So is it logical? Not really. But I mean, there's something something about specifically naming somebody. Yeah, yeah that's something really inherent in our Christian faith too. When we baptize someone, we give them a name, yeah. an identity. Um, that's how they're known as a child of God, you know. And and they're important. They're not just some general number. They're an important person or name. Does it affect you as shepherd to like name name your sheep? Yeah, I mean, I think it's good. I, I I think it's good. It's good for the people. It's not only good for people who are paid for. It's good for those of us who are submitting the names too, because it makes us, you know, it's it's a prayer to to take the effort to go to church to get a list to write out to sit there to think about who needs prayers. You know, that's an exercise for us as well. It helps us pray. Well, I have a question. They, when you pray, back when you were praying for the prophets, apostles, and the bishops, and all yeah. them, their name, how did they rank to get their name in there? And <laughs> all the others are covered in an umbrella <laughs> yeah. anybody else that's left over. I don't know. That's a, I, yeah, whoever wrote the prayer decided. And, and sometimes there's some variety. So, like, if you were in the Church of Greece versus the Church of Cyprus versus the Church of in Lebanon or something, you might get some slightly different names. Right. The, the basic first few will be the same, and then they might include more local <clears throat> local representatives of that category. I uh, so we've got some Russians in here, but they have Greeks and theirs. Yeah, yeah. It's different. I mean, the list that he has here is different than the list, but none of the list that we have in the church. I've seen it. I mean, it's usually basically the same. I mean, these are all these are all those the big guys, you know, Nicholas, St. Nicholas, St. Spirit on, you know, these are the and then and then all others. Except yeah, everybody else. Yeah. These are the famous Saint Saint Nectario. And I mean Saint Nectario, you see all these names from, from 1700 years ago, and then Saint Nectario sounds yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's how big he is. That is yeah. All right. Uh Okay, once the celebrant has commemorated the living, he goes on to commemorate the departed, those who are unable to help themselves and who look to us to show them our love. <clears throat> the first way in which the departed are helped is by the prayers of the saints, which reach even to hell. In the life of St. Macarius the Egyptian, it is recounted that the saint once encountered the skull of a pagan priest in the desert and heard a voice coming from it saying, Whenever you have compassion upon those in hell and pray for them, they receive a little comfort. <clears throat> that's, that's, a, that's a kind of famous, famous story from the Desert mm -hmm. Fathers. The second way in which they are helped is by the divine liturgy. Our brethren who have fallen asleep are not deprived of the sanctification which Holy Communion conveys to the living. For Christ gives of himself to the departed too, in a way known to him. <clears throat> In the divine liturgy, the souls of the departed receive remission of sins through the prayers of the priest and by the grace of the precious gifts which have been sanctified. The gifts here. <clears throat> St. John Chrysostom writes, not by accident did the holy apostles decree that the departed should be commemorated in the presence of the awesome mysteries. They knew that there is much to be gained from that, much benefit. When all the people stand with their hands raised in prayer, when the entire priesthood is present, and the terrible sacrifice that is Christ is in their midst. How is it possible for God not to bow to our supplications on their behalf? Therefore, let us never tire of helping those who have departed and offering the divine Eucharist for them. For here before us lies Christ, the propitiation of the whole world. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So especially now during this time of year, the tradition is, <clears throat> I'd say this is a tradition of a small thing, that... Um, the 40 days of the nativity fast now, uh, a lot of churches will do a liturgy every day. <laughs> and especially people will send in the names, especially of the uh, departed. So during that 40 days, so people at the beginning of the nativity fast will submit their names <laughs> and then they'll be read every liturgy for 40 days leading up to Christmas. That's, uh, Father Mike and I keep talking about doing that 
Um, but it's you know it's it's a it's a commitment to do you have to, to do, it. Yeah. To do liturgy yeah. every day, <laughs> and a lot of times on the weekdays, um, you know, they'll do it. We'll do it like in Greece anyway. We did it early in the morning so that people could come before uh, work. <clears throat> and I remember one time in my mm -hmm. in my village, I, I wanted to do it, <clears throat> but. Um, it was hard to get a chanter to come, you know, to get the chanter to come for 40 days in a row at 6 a.m., you know, hmm. you got to find someone, you got, that's a big favor to ask. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I, I didn't have a chanter who could do it. But I remember asking this friend of mine, a priest in another village, um, remember it's winter when this is happening. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I did it, I would maybe get one person to come for the liturgy. And I remember asking him because they were doing it over at his church. And I said, How many people can you get to come to these? You know, they were doing them at like 5 a.m. or something. He's like, Yeah, not very many. I don't, we only get like 40 people. <laughs> <laughs> In the winter? You guys are doing something right. You know, what you've been describing, even if there is one or two people for liturgy, there's a lot of people. Yes, exactly. Being right. towards the liturgy. Exactly. That's why, yeah. It's not really, uh, yeah, well, we do the services because we want to pray to God. And that's, as, as priests, of course, we like it when people come and pray with us in the services, but, you know, it's our job to pray. So, you know, people are always coming to me during, every day during the week saying, please pray for so-and-so, please pray for so-and-so. So that's why we do the services, so that we can pray for those people. And we consider it an honor that, I mean, you guys have to work, but our job is to uh, so that we can pray, and so we pray for you, even though you can't pray. You know, if you're at work, then we'll give us an answer. We pray for you, and you're praying your own way. Your prayer is to make that effort to get us the names. You pray silently. Yeah, of course. Yeah, everybody. Can, yeah, pray silently. But you do that, and and uh, give the names to be prayed for in the liturgy. It's a special blessing. <laughs> do you encourage us to make a big list of names to keep in our prayer form? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. You know, when you do your prayers in the morning or in the evening, if you want to, at the end of your prayers, usually it says in the book, you know, now, now I make private prayers or private. Yeah, it's good to have a list of people that you're praying for. <laughs> um, a lot of people have that. And then, uh, and then you know, now in the modern, with all this modern technology, it's, you know, like Hala, the, the other Hala, oh. <laughs> she has a list of names. That she has on her computer, and so she's just she's just the praying, day. praying, <laughs> praying. It's in the thing it flies because if you're in the parade, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's always ready for those names. So if we handed you the church directory, you know, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to feel about technology? But it is something nice though about. I mean, that's it is just good. However, you can do it. But, you can do it but there's a nice but right. And I get to write it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a prayer. It's, it's a personal. Yeah. 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 Because there's more names. Yeah, usually we like the the baptismal names because, like you said, that's how they're known to God. That's how they've been identified. Made a made an individual, made a Christian uh, in that name, but you know, so we prefer a baptismal name. But sometimes you know, we don't know somebody's baptismal name that we want to pray for. So we pray to the man. Yeah. 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 However you go. All right. Let's see. During the time when the priest is commemorating the living and departed brother, each of the faithful may also commemorate his family and those dear to him. On the holy mountain, meaning Mount Athos, the celebrant priest brings a little bell so that those present can commemorate whomever they wish at the same time he is cutting out particles on their behalf. So 830, 845, I'm reading all these lists of names, cutting out particles. A lot of times, and not just on Mount Athos, in other parishes I've seen it, if you hear a little bell during Orthos, it means that the, that the priest is commemorating names. And so like the deacon, who would start commemorating his name while I'm doing this? Everybody in the church can just be thinking, okay, you know, praying silently to yourself about those, those you want to pray for. So that's when the bell. Yeah, yeah. 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 at the little church, Timmy Stavrol, years ago, they, yeah. they yeah. Yeah. a little bell. That's yeah. what it was. Years and years ago. Yeah. So, what, do we have one? Oh. <laughs> 
I have a little bill and I'm going to do one. Is that for Charles? That's what I did. We're going to get that on. You have on this up. Yeah. It's a little. It's just a little. It's one of the hexes. It makes it easy. For yeah. Me. Okay. Yeah. Should we also write our guest ear list for Charles? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to have a little bit of a piece. Yeah. Yeah. So when the priest had finished, has finished commemorating the living and the departed, he beseeches Christ to remember also his own unworthiness. Commemoration of the divine liturgy is one of the greatest gifts we can receive or offer to our brethren. Christ is before us, crucified, and we take courage from the example of the thief on the cross and beseech him, remember us, Lord, in your kingdom. <clears throat> God in the midst of gods. In the Lamb and the particles assembled on the Holy Path, we have an image of the church. So, I mean, look at it now. that We've, we've completed it. We have Lamb, we have Christ himself, we have his mother and throne at his right hand. We have the nine categories of saints representing all the saints. At his left hand, we have, then down below, we have the church present here, the church militant, we call it, headed by the bishop, uh, and then uh, the living, and then church triumphant, the, the repose. So in this image here, and it's circular, representing the, the whole world, the whole universe, we have an image of the whole church right there, <clears throat> gathered around Christ. Close to Christ and his holy mother, in the company of the angels and saints, we experience the reality of the Eucharistic Ecumenical Council of the Church, meaning the Eucharistic, meaning uh, we're celebrating the Eucharist, the, uh, the becoming the body of the Christ. Ecumenical meaning worldwide, universal council, gathering, of the assembly of the Church. We see Christ himself in the whole of his one Church, having in its midst him who is the true light. His mother is to the right. The saints and angels to the left, while below we have the entire devout assembly of the faithful. And this is the great mystery. God in the midst of humans, or rather in the midst of gods, as it says in Psalm 81. Those who are being led to deification by him who is truly God by nature, who became flesh for their sake. This is also the kingdom which is to come, the polity of eternal life. God with us, seen and partaken of. <clears throat> At the divine liturgy, we see upon the pattern the assembly of God, which the Son assembled together through himself. Christ has assembled us together into the liturgy of his kingdom. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're going to cover the gifts. This is, this is the part Deacon Tikkun will uh, be sorry he missed. So then the deacon takes the censer. So at this point, all right, so just to give you an idea of realistically, when is this happening? So we're comparing this as the first priest does his list of the living and the dead. Then in our case in the cathedral where we have multiple priests, then the second priest in order, <laughs> it would be his turn. So I would, I would leave, the second priest would come, and he would commemorate whatever list of names he has, living and then the dead. Then the third priest would come, then the fourth priest. Um, and then, uh, so we leave it open, usually we call it. We leave it open <laughs> until... Uh, when we go out and sense for the Theotokos and the Mother of the Light. Mm -hmm. we, we sense, and then that's usually the cue when they come back. After that's concluded, the sensor is lit and ready, and we go and we close the, the proscomedia. <laughs> so we leave it open for that time so that all the priests can commemorate. And sometimes, you know, not so much here, but like in Greece, people who aren't there from the beginning of the liturgy, they might come and stick their, their hand in with a list of names or something that we can read. No, it's not just the top priest that does that. You know, there's the one priest that represents Jesus right. during the liturgy. This is open to all the priests. Right. So the one the one priest gets it all ready, mm -hmm. and then the other priest comes and just takes out the names. He doesn't like redo the whole thing. Yeah, just adds to it. And when the when the bishop is here, uh, the bishop of course does it. So the priest gets it ready for him, but the bishop is the one who does most of it. <clears throat> all right. See, uh, yeah, okay. So the deacon takes. So now we're we're getting closer to we're after nine o'clock now, <laughs> maybe nine ten something like that. After the cell tokens and the light, after the sensing, the deacon takes the censer 
and says to the priest, Master, bless the incense. And the priest blesses it, saying the prayer of the incense. So whenever you see the priest turn off to the side and bless something, that's usually him blessing the censer. We offer incense to you, Christ our God, as a fragrance of spiritual sweetness. Accept it on your altar above the heavens and send down upon us in return the grace of your Holy Spirit. So we're sending up incense and we're asking him to send down the grace of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Lord Almighty says to his prophet Malachi, From the rising of the sun until its setting, my name is glorified among the nations. And in every place incense is offered to my name and a pure sacrifice. When, this pro when was this prophecy fulfilled? An incense offered to God in every place and a pure sacrifice, asked St. John Chrysostom. And he gives the answer. Only after the coming of Christ, the pure sacrifice is the divine Eucharist. When one compares the Jewish sacrifice with the offering of the Eucharist, one realizes that this alone could truly be called a pure sacrifice, for it is not offered with smoke and the stench of meat, nor with the blood of animals and atonements, but with the grace of the Holy Spirit. The incense, which the celebrant now uses, is a, pre, is a prefiguration of the descent of the Holy Spirit on the gifts which are offered. <laughs> the fragrant smoke signifies the fragrance of the Holy Spirit. As the celebrant senses, he honors God by the offering of incense and by its fragrance, and indicates that whatever he does, he does together with the Holy Spirit. As the incense catches fire and burns and gives off fragrant smoke, it signifies the grace of the Holy Spirit who brilliantly illumines our senses and at the same time makes them fragrant, spiritual fragrance. He illumines because he is light and is seen by the pure in heart. He gives off a pleasant scent because he is the tree of life, which crucifies, that is, puts to death, the will of the flesh and makes the whole world fragrant. <clears throat> St. John Chrysostom urges us to set our soul on fire with divine zeal so that through prayer the soul itself may become a censor. Just as incense is good and fragrant, even on its own, but displaying its fragrance properly when it comes in contact with fire, so it is with prayer. It is good even on its own, but it becomes even better and more fragrant when it is offered up with a warm and ardent soul. When the soul becomes a censer and is burning with fierce fire, first set your heart on fire by your eagerness, and then pray. In the liturgy of St. James, so that's, this is another liturgy. There are multiple liturgies, but in practice, we use St. John Chrysostom's liturgy most of the time. But the liturgy of St. James, we've done in the cathedral before, once a year. It's a lot of reading of the Psalms. In the liturgy of St. James, a celebrant beseeches Christ to count him worthy to stand at the holy altar with soul and body fragrant. Master, Lord Jesus Christ, Word of God, who willingly brought yourself to God the Father as an unblemished sacrifice on the cross, who are the coal and two natures, which was carried in tongs to touch the lips of the prophet and took away his sins. As the prophet Isaiah at his calling at the beginning of the book. Touch also the senses of us sinners, cleanse us from every stain, and present us in purity at your holy altar, so as to offer to you a sacrifice of praise. Receive also this incense from us, your unworthy servants, as a sweet-smelling fragrance. Make fragrant the stench of our souls and bodies, and sanctify us by the sanctifying power of your Holy Spirit. All right, so now we're going to start the, the covering. So we bless the incense, and then this will be the last section we read. So now we take, <clears throat> this is called the star. So we're going to take the star, and we're going to place it on top to protect all this that we've done, right? So then we're gonna put the covering on top of it, um, but this is just to protect it, right? So it's, it's really a practical thing. But does it not represent the Star of Bethlehem? Yes, it does. So let us pray to the Lord, make firm master. That's what the deacon says. The, the priest senses the star, so the deacon's holding the censer. I take this and uh, wave it three times in the form of a cross over the censer and place it on here. While saying, the star came to rest over the place where the child was with Mary, his mother, from the Christmas story. <laughs> Deacon, let us pray to the Lord, glorify Mass. Priest senses the first veil and covers the lamb and pattern with it, saying, The Lord is king, he is clothed with majesty, and the Lord is clothed and girded himself with power, for he has established the world which will not be changed. So, this is the first veil here. Place it. Like this. 
The Lord is king and clothed in majesty. Before Christ became man, mankind was enslaved to the devil, to sin and death. The devil would deceive us, sin would slay us, and death would bury us. Christ became incarnate in order to free us from the tyranny of the devil and sin and give us the freedom of the Holy Spirit. The human race was subjugated to the tyranny of Satan, since as a result of the fall, it strayed far from the kingdom of God. That was why the only begotten Son of God came to earth, to subdue our race under his own scepter once more. And so it happened. Thus was fulfilled the prophecy of the psalmist. The Lord is king and he is clothed with majesty. For God's majesty is the name given to the salvation of the human race. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with power, the psalmist adds. So these, these verses that we've been reading throughout this whole service are a lot of times from the psalm. <laughs> what is the power that Christ the king put on and girded himself with when he became incarnate? It is his all holy body that became the garment which Christ put on him at his incarnation. The psalmist calls the body of Christ itself his clothing. When he clothes and girds himself, this symbolizes the destruction of the hostile powers of the devil, which Christ accomplished, having assumed in a way the form of a warrior. So Christ took on human flesh and tricked Satan into swallowing him up in death. And so this was the the clothing that he put on that ended up being the defeat of Satan. <clears throat> Christ's all holy flesh became for him a garment, clothing, and a girdle. With his clothing and this girdle, he overcame the powerful devil. He snatched the prisoners out of his hands and freed them, binding the devil himself in chains. And for us who have been saved, the flesh of the Savior became the power of God. Christ so the devil is in chains, in chains yeah. right now? Mm -hmm. He's, he's, he's bound. He's bound. He's, he's bound in hell right now. He's bound, but he he's not, uh, what can you say? It's almost like, <laughs> this is a silly analogy, but like a mafia boss, right? You, he, you get him in prison, but he's still able to run things. Mm -hmm. He's in prison, yeah. but he's, he's not able to run things. Yeah, he's got, that's he's got his messengers. That's kind of the image of the He's represented in the resurrection icons. He's right. bound. bound yeah. Yeah, but, but, you know, I, I guess I always thought that you know Jesus did go yeah. down, but I never thought of him still being there. But he'll finally be completely vanquished when Christ comes down. When did he lose one? What's that? When did he lose one? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'll have to wait till we do Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> Christ was victorious and established the world, that is, the church, upon the true and unshakable rock which is himself. The church leaps for joy over Christ's victory and makes festival in honor of his kingdom. And that worldwide celebration is the divine life. All right, so we'll stop there and then we'll finish up with this next time. I have one question. Yeah. All the miracles of feeding the multitudes, a little bit of food, and fed thousands. Right. And the chalice, if we got it large, would it just keep replicating? Huh. I've never had it run out. Never. Isn't it something? Yeah. yeah. You know, it would make sense if we just keep going, just like feeding the thousands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You say that. I think of the story of this friend of mine, a priest in Greece. Uh, he was an American also, <clears throat> and you know, in, in Greece, people will, you know, like fight. There's no lines. Here, they're elbowing each other. He gets to the front, <laughs> and one time he he stopped this guy who was like elbowing his way to the front. He's like, "We're not gonna run out." You know, well, <laughs> yeah, that's just like some of our people used to just run to be first. <laughs> and that was still the soul. Not the children are going. The old people are going. In the garden of Eden, God revealed Himself to Adam and Eve. Right? Yeah. So no, nowhere back then was Christ revealed to them. Is that right? Well, we would say that that the God whose feet were, you know, they heard his feet walk. Yeah. We would say that that was Christ. <laughs> it was the technical term is the pre-incarnate Christ. The you know, one the, that was walking. Yeah, walking the, 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 
these manifestations of God in the Old Testament, we as Orthodox Jews say, were pre the pre incarnate Christ or toward Christ. Well, well, he was there from the beginning. Yes. So, like you, you said right. earlier, the angels have never even seen it yeah. twice. So, I just wanted to see it. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.